Shoot it. Better floor it. Better floor it. Shoot it. Well, all right, just stay ahead of it. Keep going, man. Keep going. Faster? Dude. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots faster. Lots faster. Lots faster, Greg. It's catching us. You gotta go, buddy. You gotta really go. go there's the hook this is just classic and this could be a large tornado we just stress a sense of urgency here for those of you in these communities we have a checklist of about 30 parameters we go through every morning during tornado season that's March April May the morning of April 8th almost all 30 had the red flag the first thunderstorms that developed over eastern Mississippi and West Alabama within a matter of 10 or 15 minutes, they began to all, all of them showed signs of being supercell thunderstorms. We just knew that this was a powder keg. This thing could explode like a supercell type thunderstorm. Uh, so this is a very urgent situation. Now let's go back to the big picture. A lot of people I begin to make a very clear effort not to make any mistakes on the air. Don't miss the name of a town. Don't miss a location of a thunderstorm because I know in my heart this is dangerous stuff and some people might die if we make a mistake out here. These are the big points. Number one, a small room. That's a hall, a closet, or a bathroom. Lowest floor. Don't go up, you go down if you have a basement. A small tornado can knock a tree down that can go through the roof of a home and it can kill someone. A small tornado can blow a vehicle off the road. But most of the people that die in tornadoes die from the larger type tornadoes, the F4s and the F5s. Those tornadoes have wind velocities approaching 300 miles per hour. They can strip the bark off trees. They can carry frame houses considerable distance to a point where they disintegrate. They are the most violent storms on Earth. Nathan was studying about earthquakes in his weekly readers at school. And he was saying how glad he was that he didn't live in California where they have earthquakes. And I said, yeah, here we just have tornadoes and you can hide from a tornado. And an hour later, we were laying in the woods. He would talk about heaven, that he wanted to go there so that he could climb the tree of life and swim in the river of life is what he said. And I can hear him in my mind right now saying it. He was very, very tender tender-hearted, um, but loved, loved to have fun. I mean, there's nothing more this child wanted to do than play. Just honest as the day is long, he, if he ever lied, he would usually come and tell you <laughs> a 
<laughs> later that he had lied. It's now east of the Warrior River, uh, and again, it's actually more in this area, so don't... I had gone and gotten Nathan from school so he could play with the little boy down the street. They'd been out playing, riding bicycles, and playing with Coco, her dog. And I called him in for dinner. It was starting to get cloudy for the rain that was coming. We were sitting and eating dinner when things got really intense. That's when me and the children went into the bedroom and put the mattress over us and leaned it against the wall to make a little tent area for the children and I sit in. I remember Christy saying, she was talking to the kids and I love you guys, you know, almost because she knew that's what she needed to say. She, she just knew that, I guess it's that female instinct or something, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, oh God, you know, here we go. And she's, I love you. And then I heard it. I heard this roar, this low pitch, fast moving, deep, deep roar. It felt like fingers of a big hand went under the house and you could feel the wind scooping the house up off the foundation. And at the same time that it scooped the house up, it crunched everything. You could hear the windows snapping, the wood popping, everything breaking. All at the same time with this huge wind coming underneath it and the distinct sensation of spinning. and we were laying in the thunderstorms that came behind it. It stunk so bad. I hated the way it smelled, never wanted to smell it again. It smelled real strong of pine because of all the trees that were broken, but it was more than just a pine smell. It stunk with just an evil sort of smell. Our neighbors that lived to the left of us managed to get out of the debris and got to me the first hour. He said, we're gonna have to walk to get help because there's nothing left. Everything's been destroyed. There's no phones, no power. There's nothing left. And my heart just sank in my stomach because I thought, everything's gone. Everything, everywhere was gone. I could hear Margaret and John Michael crying after a minute or two. I knew they were off to my right and down a little ways from where I was. And I was just afraid they were gonna get up and walk off. So I just told them, just, mommy's here, I love you. Sit still, don't move. And I knew Matthew was behind me and off to my right. I realized that I couldn't feel my legs. And then I was, and that, that kind of, I thought, uh-oh, you know, I can't get up. I can't do anything. I can't help anybody. I, I can't help myself, you know. I'm in, I'm in serious trouble here. I knew that Nathan was laying directly beside me. He was so cold. The rain was really cold. And it had blown his shirt up, so it was just the bare skin of his stomach that my hand had landed on. And I thought he was dead at first and didn't know who he was. And then he took a breath, and I knew it was him by the way he sounded. One of his arms, his right arm, was underneath the arch of my back. And I thought that he was trying at first to pull his arm out. And I was trying to tell him, just hold still, lay still. They'll get to us. The people are coming to help us. Just lay still. And then I realized he was having seizures and that he couldn't understand. The rescuers got Nathan out first. Carried him on the door. Took him to get some help. They told us there was a lady trapped in a house up on the hill, which was Miss Seals, Christy Seals. So we got up there, and she was sitting just in the woods. It picked her house up, and 
and just it threw it about 300 yards back up in the woods. And she couldn't stood, she couldn't stand to be laid down. They were going to try to take her, carry her out. She, you know, she had broken ribs and punctured lung. We found a chair, like a kitchen table chair, and uh, we sat her in this chair. And I was trying to support her leg, her left leg, and carry one corner of the chair. And then we had someone else supporting her head. We had to walk over trees, down this mountainside, through the woods. It was really hectic. Finally, after about 45 minutes, we got her to a truck. Her willpower was so strong, and she was hurt so bad. Her left leg, it was broken so bad. These people were sitting here 15 minutes ago watching TV, had just finished eating dinner, and now everything they own is gone. The men that got us were real brave. They saw a lot of things that were really unpleasant to look at. You never really want to go and find someone mangled up from something like this. The emergency personnel that were bringing patients in, they were unusually silent. They were crying um, in shock. A lot of them stayed with the kids that they brought in. Some of them would stay and hold their hand, and they had a bond with them, because out in the field, uh, they were together for a while before they actually got transported, so that was someone that they knew, because there were no parents here. About four hours after Nathan's arrival was when we received word that the child could be Christy's son. At that moment, all the beeping and it seemed like all the noise in the unit stopped. We all realized that it could have been us or one of our loved ones. That night, the doctor came over to my hospital bed and sat down. And since I work on that unit, I know her. And she just asked me, she said, Christy, I don't think Nathan's going to make it through the night. If he goes, do you want me to code him? I knew the extent of his injuries and knew that he was really sick. And it wasn't the kind of sick that you just get better from. When a doctor asks you, do you... You know, do you want me to take resuscitation efforts on your child? It, um, that was hard. They give us the option, you know, that his brain is, is not showing a whole lot of activities, very little. So we can remove all this machinery and just see what happens and, and basically let him die. But we just couldn't make that decision. We, we just could not say, do that. I remember praying, God, I can't make this decision. Christy and I cannot decide whether or not Nathan should live or die. Don't make me have to say, okay, take the machines off or leave them on or, Lord, don't, don't let us have to make that decision. That's your decision, Lord. Life and death is your decision, not mine. They arranged an ambulance to take me over to the hospital. They took me on a stretcher and took me to the intensive care unit there at Children's. And I laid there with him beside his bed for three hours and talked to him and kind of went over his whole life with him and just all the neat things. And the next day is when Nathan passed away. But there was a sweet peace about it. There really was, because Nathan loved God. And I knew, I knew that Nathan was where he wanted to be. When he died, I just said goodbye to him and said, you go climb the trees, and I'll meet you there. And I know he's there. Seeing his funeral on our newscast uh, was very difficult. Uh, Nathan's little casket, the mother body cast, the father paralyzed, the siblings injured very badly. That let me know that this was a community tragedy. And why did that little boy have to die? I still ask myself that question. 
the people that live in these communities, these are very godly people. They will do anything to help their neighbor. They live by the golden rule. I don't have the answer. I really don't. I don't think anybody does. This tornado initially touched down about 30 miles west of downtown Birmingham. The damage was consistent for 20 miles. The width of the tornado at its widest point was over one half mile. Some of these people that were hurt, they were literally in the air, flying in the air. And when they were back on the ground, they had no clue where they were because the landscape had changed. This was a Wednesday night, and many people that live here go to church on Wednesday night. And we had a report that a church had been destroyed. Now we have a search and rescue in progress right here. It was like the hand of God, and I believe it was the hand of God, that just held that structure in place and held us in place that we were going to walk out of this uh, without being killed. doors into the parking lot and I stood very still and I listened and I felt and one of the older girls came out and I turned to her and I said Steppy you listen to Mama Nick very closely this is when you worry you feel how still it is how quiet it is there's no rain there's no wind this is when you worry it is true, it does sound like a freight train. I looked at the group and I said, that's it, move it. And we all started running down the length of the sanctuary, going into the hallway. We sat with our backs against the wall and I had two small boys, two five-year-olds sitting next to me. And the children had decided to sing. They were singing, Jesus loves me, when the lights began to flicker. Jill Presley, one of our youth, came up to me and she tugged on my sh sh her shirt and she said, Pastor, uh, the Lord just spoke to me. And I said, he did. And she said, yeah, he gave me a message for the church. I had like this weird feeling like God, God was talking to me. And it's real, I don't know, I try to describe it and it's real hard to do. She said that no matter what happens, the church is going to be okay. God was trying to tell us that we would be okay, and she said that no one would die, even if it did hit. Hey, coming down. Oh, we've got significant rotation. walks out to it's the... Down. It's, down. it's down. We have a big tornado. The lights went out, and that was when I realized we were in serious trouble. I heard the awning leave the front of the church, and I heard the glass pop, and the whole front of the church, which was glass, left. The roof went, and we were being suctioned into the hallway. The wind started blowing, and you could feel little bits of debris starting to cut you. And I had my arm around my friend. That's when I kept thinking, like, oh my gosh, Leanna, don't blow away from me. And it was like really loud and your ears popped and it smelled really bad. It smelled like everything in the world mixed together. It was really scary. I wrapped my arm around my dad and um, then I just like buried my head into like his jacket. I was being literally pulled into it. I had turned around sideways, lifted my arms and covered the children to my right. And I was thinking, Lord, thank you for making me such a large woman that I'm able to protect these children. You could feel the swirling and the sucking. I just thought, Lord, just protect me. And I was praying that Jesus would save me. I felt like this was when God was going to take me. And it was at that moment the wind stopped. 
and everything outside quietened down. Everything inside was very chaotic. I was buried under debris. The roof, the beams holding them up were all hanging down. The wires were hanging down. I thought, there's got to be dead bodies buried under this debris. There was sheet rock. There was all kinds of things everywhere. Everyone was screaming, and we went outside. <laughs> and the rain was so cold. It was like freezing. And I started going into shock, you know. I was like shaking really bad. And I didn't know where my dad was, and I was so scared. The parking lot, which had been full, was empty. They began to look for their cars, and they were all in a ravine. They looked like tuna cans in a, in a wastebasket, one on top of the other. I couldn't believe the devastation. The church itself just imploded. We had no sanctuary. We had no, no walls on the backside. It looked as though the only thing that was left standing was the hallway that we were in. God extended his hand and put it right over the hallway where those 70 people were, we 70 people were, and the rest of the building collapsed around it. Something happened to me that night and I, I saw angels. There were angels there that night calling for help because demons were trying to push the slabs in on us. But um, the angels like got more help, and so the, flat, the slabs fell out instead of in on us. And so that I knew then that it was really angels. I believe that the devil sent it, but God made it a miracle. God took care of us. A miracle happened. I believe in miracles. I am one. The hardest thing that night was knowing that there were people hurt out there and it was going to take a long time for them to get help. I felt helpless. We did everything that you said. You, you, you pointed out on the, on the weather map and you showed. While I was on television, this fellow was looking at me and I could see out of the corner of my eye that there was a man coming at me and I wasn't sure what was going to happen because I was talking on live television. I, think I had six households, six households of family members on my street and we're all alive because of you. I don't know about that, but I think the important thing is for people that are watching. When most people say something like that, they really don't mean it. They're just there to try and make friends or whatever. But when I looked that guy in the eyes, I knew that this guy really meant that. Well, God bless you, and I'm glad you're alive, and thank you for sharing that story with thank us. You. Okay. Let's go back to uh, Pam and Josh. Yeah, look. It's going up and then... Oh, there it is right there. It's not even touching me. Is it touching the ground? Yeah, see the smoke on the, on the ground? Yeah. Can we leave somewhere? No, we gotta stay in the house. How about if it comes really towards us? We get in the car and go places? Get in the house, guys. It's right there. Hear it? Here it comes. Get in the house! I know, I'll be right in. This fucking thing is coming right at us. The tornado accumulates debris as it goes. If it's over open land, it's picking up soil and grass and rocks. If it goes over a barbed wire fence, it picks up the barbed wire fence. If it goes over a tractor, it's got tractor parts in it. It's almost like a grenade that's got shrapnel in it. A tornado itself won't kill you. It's what it has in it. I came around a curve, and about 1.20 in the afternoon, there was uh, 
a tornado about four miles, five miles north of Gerald, which was mostly stationary for about 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, that tornado began to move toward the south, toward Gerald. Three, two, one. People literally stopped along I-35 to watch the storm come right straight at them. When I got to the area north of Gerald, I turned around and looked again, and it literally almost stopped my heart. What had been a small, thin tornado had, in the time it took me to go two miles down the road, evolved into a multi-vortex tornado, a tornado where there are multiple small tornadoes on the ground revolving around each other, almost like a nest of snakes, if you will. The tornado approached the community of Gerald, and with each passing 30 seconds, got bigger and bigger and bigger. It was almost like the tornado, which had been so small and so thin, had taken aim at that community. It was already really big by the time we saw it. Man, that tornado turned into a huge field back there. The tornado touched down back there, it's huge. That was a very scary feeling, to look up and see something that huge, that close. It also mesmerizes you. You just stand there. You can't pull yourself away from it because it's something that you've never seen before, and it's hard to believe it's actually there. I came to the intersection of 487 and 35. That's kind of the main drag for downtown Gerald. And there was a lot of people at that intersection. They were just all uh, probably 50, 60 people. Everybody was hollering, you know, what's going on, what's going on. I crawled up between the two highways there at the top of the embankment and looked out, and then that's when I could see the, the, the F5. So I got back underneath that overpass uh, and just kind of, you know, prayed like everybody else. Kids, it's coming toward our house. God, please make it go away. <laughs> dropped my stomach. When they say gone, there was literally nothing. The hard part is getting it set up to where you had to start looking for victims. And you have hundreds of people going arm length apart and patrolling an area, just every little piece of debris. The first victim that I came across, you, you could see that it was a human form, but uh, the wind had abraded the, the body so much that your body does, or your mind disconnects you from it. You say almost like, hey, that's not a real person there, you know, but you know in your heart that it is. Once you come across one and then another and another and another, it just kind of snowballs on you and you begin to hate the storm. My problem was that I thought maybe my grandsons were flying around hollering for their daddy. One is bad if you have a funeral, but we had four. The school had just stopped for the year, and all of the kids were at home, and my son was a bluebell ice cream route man, and he had rushed home, and everybody was trying to get in the shelter of a house, and <laughs> there was just no house. <clears throat> to be saved in the path of this thing. We talked with a lady that had seen our family standing out in the yard watching it. 
and then all of a sudden it made a turn and they couldn't get out. It was Wednesday night or early Thursday morning before positive identification had been made on my son and his wife. My wife, that had had a severe stroke, so I didn't know what her mental condition would be. And once I found out, I just put up to her bed and I said, honey, God, tell you something. Our kids didn't make it. And immediately she started to cry. There's no way you can explain the emptiness that you feel because you know nobody did nothing wrong. And you cannot say, why me? Why, why my family? Because there's no answer. If you have loved ones, tell them you love them. Because they might not be here tomorrow. First day back to school was pretty tough because there was a good number of students of ours that were lost. You have them in class the week before, and then you go to their funeral the week later. And it, that's, that was real tough. Uh, that was probably one of the harder things to do. Some of the members of the football team were victims. The first football game that we had without the boys was an emotional game. 27 people's lives were gone, and the final score of our game was 27. Being in a town where you do know everybody, and you have people wave and say hello to you all the time, you can look back and see the people that were lost. You're gonna miss those people, and I think they will always be missed. I came across a photograph. It came from a couple that was traveling through here. They saw the funnel cloud, so they stopped and started taking pictures. In one of these pictures, if you turned it sideways, it showed Jesus standing there with his arms outstretched. You can make the robe, the sleeves of the robe. There's even a halo up around where the head is. I got goosebumps as soon as I saw it. It just sent such a chill over me. But then it also put me at ease a little bit because it made me think that he was there telling us that it's okay, that he saw what was going on and he came to get the people here that had died and take them back with him. Okay, I put the tornado now about uh, whatever. one and one half miles, 300 degrees. Okay, okay, hold on, wait a second. Slow down. Yeah, RFD, big time. Watch out for spin ups. Face the wind, face the wind, back it up. All right, there you go. Go face the wind. Tornado's large. Whoa, what a hard Tornado on the ground. 911 emergency. Oh my God, help us! Okay, ma'am, a tornado just hit that area. Is everybody okay? I'm very scared of lightning, and I had never seen anything like it. It was bright white, and I, I started riding my bike so fast that, you know, when you ride so fast and you stop, your legs are shaking, and I got to the front porch, and I just dropped the bike. I was crying, and Mark got down on the step behind me, you know, and hugged me, and, he's, and he went out and got the bike, and he said, it's okay. Five minutes later, he was cooking dinner. I looked out the window, and we have these pine trees in our yard. They were going sideways. You could hear things starting to drop on the top of the trailer, and you could feel it starting to shake. The hair on my neck just stood up. So he grabbed my hand, and we ran back to the, to the bathroom. And I got in the bathtub, and I was sitting there, and I was getting ready to pull him in, and he said, get out. 
It's not safe. We came around the corner of the bathroom, and I could hear it. It was really, it was just it was so loud, it was almost deafening. The closet was right behind me. That was the only place we had to go, so he just pushed me in. We were probably that far away from each other, holding each other's hands. And I was trying to get him in the closet. That was the last time I looked in his eyes. And I never in seven years ever saw fear, and I saw it. When I landed, I realized I was alive, and I was screaming his name. I screamed his name, and he didn't answer me. And I knew, I think I knew then, I never wanted to see that in his face. I wanted to protect him from that. I would like people to remember Mark as a hero. He pulled me out of that bathtub. The bathtub was found 40 yards away, wrapped in half around a tree. There's no way I would have lived. I miss his laugh, and I miss his smile. Situation only. We just had three tornadoes touch down. I know. I was just reporting one to you. Okay, where's it at? It's in uh, South Kissimmee by the overpass at Bermuda. Is it there right now? No, I can hear. I've been hearing it go, and it's been blowing a transformer. Going yes. Okay, okay, thank you very much, sir. As we came up to the crest of the bridge, there was a convenience store that sat to the left of the road, surrounded by big oak trees, and there was, I mean, just complete portions of the, of the store in the middle of the road. We had to slam on the brakes. My parents live another three quarters of a mile to a mile down that road, and I'm like, you know, oh my God. At that point, Osceola County Sheriff's car had come over the bridge. We saw his headlights shining back into the campground. It looked like a bomb had hit. So we said, let's see if we can help. So we parked across the street and got out, and we walked up to the sheriff, and, and that's his profession. But even, I think, he was stunned by what he had seen. And we asked him, is there anything that we can do to help? And he said, just see if you can find anybody alive. There was a huge tree across the drive, so you couldn't get back in there. And just as we got over the tree, there was some residents that lived there that were walking around, and they were crying, of course, and they were dazed. You couldn't see the end of the line of ambulances and fire trucks and rescue vehicles, and they couldn't get to us because of everything in the road. It was just so frustrating. You could hear a cry for help to the left, and I said, there's somebody over here that's calling for help. So we took our flashlights, and we had walked to the left, and uh, that's when uh, we had found Laura. It looked like she had been picked up and thrown into the ground, and it was kind of like a crater. My roommate, Bob, he said he's going to go help some other people. And I said, well, I'm going to stay here with her. You know, I'll just stay with her because she was alert. And, you know, I kept going through my mind, if that was my grandmother or my mom, you know, I'd want somebody to be there with him. It was just the two of us sitting there trying to make her comfortable. It seemed like she was getting weaker and weaker. And I just, like, just don't let her die here in front of me. She was talking about it was her time. She was going to go meet her husband. Just the thought of her dying or, or death. And I was like, no, no, you can't talk like that. I hadn't heard from my mother yet. I didn't know if they were OK. And I'm like, no, my mom can't leave me now, you know? You can't leave your sons, because she kept mentioning Roger. And I said, well, what's his number? I've got my phone. Let's call him. I picked it up on the first ring. And the voice on the other end uh, said that um, I'm with your mom. Your mom is hurt. She's in a lot of pain. I heard mom's voice in the background. And she said, let me talk to Roger. 
She got on the phone and I could tell the desperation in her voice. It wasn't a normal mom's voice. She says, Roger, whatever you do, don't come down here. And I said, well, where are you, mom? And then she said, I love you, Roger. And I said, I love you too, mom. When she said, I love you, and I hung up the phone, I jumped out of bed and I said, mom's dying. And I was so distraught, I couldn't even put my pants on, I couldn't put my shirt on. I just had the sense that this was the last phone call. Finally, we got some EMTs back in there. And we got Laura put on a uh, backboard and took her out to the front. I knew she was still alive because I talked to her. I told her I would call Roger and let her, him know which hospital they were taking her to. And she said, OK, thank you. And that was the last that I had seen of her. I had the highest privilege to say to her, I love you. And the highest privilege of, of being there almost that second when Jesus came to take her home to heaven. From a good Samaritan, somebody who just happened to be riding by. I leaned over to her and I said, Mom, are you ready to be with Jesus? And she gave a little, little smile. And at that moment, I saw the lines on the screen just go blank. And she went to be with Jesus. I needed some peace. I needed something to help me get some sleep and get some comfort from what had happened. So I checked my cell phone, and that's when I came across Roger's phone number. I said, well, you know, let me just call Roger and introduce myself and find out, you know, make sure that his mom's OK. And uh, that'll help, just to find out that she's OK and that maybe I was able to help somebody out of this whole thing. So I called Roger and introduced myself told him my name, and he let me know at that point that his mom had passed away. And that just, you know, that's, <laughs> I almost hung up the phone because that was just total the opposite of what I was, you know, looking for. I know she's gone on to be with the Lord, and that's a great thing for her, but I'm still here. If you ever want a new neighborhood, it's a terrible way of getting one. We're the only ones left. The old neighborhood's gone, gone. 911, state emergency. Uh, tornado just went through us and just blew everything up. Uh, yeah, I understand that. So you're at 20 Tornado to hit us and we got children hurt. There was 13 killed on the street itself. And it was all piled up and there's people going out with dogs looking for the bodies, the firemen, the volunteers, hundreds of people was walking around trying to find the bodies. At three minutes to one, the lights went out. The lightning, I've never seen lightning like that. I've never seen it like that. And it got real still, completely still, nothing moved. And I thought, I've heard that that's bad. I come out, and I glanced over to my left, Dorothy and Mike, gone. I looked over to my right, and my other two neighbors are gone. Uh, I mean, just nothing there. They was bringing out people, but they didn't bring out Dorothy and Mike or Betty and, and uh, Donna, our other neighbors. Hello? This is dark now. You got to realize it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Anybody in here? And people are screaming, please, please help me, help me. Our neighbors and myself stood in the street and said, we want the sun to come up. We know it's going to come up, but we don't really want it to come up because we didn't want to see you know, what we thought we were going to see. And it was really, really bad. And we realized that there was nothing left of a lot of people's lives. 
They said that the winds hit 250 miles an hour here, took out those people on that side, took out Donna and Betty's coach, now figuring I'm sitting in the center now, or we are, and come around and picked up Dorothy and Mike's and threw them out and left us standing. Unreal. Now they found Dorothy and Mike right back here, a little less than an eighth of a mile, still in her 90s and stuff like that, whatever attire they went to bed in. And then they found Sandy, and they, they lined them all up in the driveway next door. And nobody that came here that was related and all could identify them because they laid out in the swamp water all night long and they shriveled up and twisted. One of the officers said, Bob, would, do you think you're strong enough to identify them? I said, I don't know, I'm half goofy now. I said, let's give it a try, I'll help, sure. And I went next door in the driveway. That's Mike, that's Dorothy, that's Donna, that's Betty. I wonder if they were like us, if they were huddled together somewhere trying to survive. We used to see each other in the grocery store just about every Saturday, Dorothy and I didn't. Every time I go in that grocery store, I just want to turn around and leave. But it, even though they were our neighbors, um, I just can't seem to get over them not being there. Regardless of how you try and shut it out, it's there. It's there forever. Dorothy and Mike will always be there. Don and Betty will always be there. And I, I can picture them. I told you every day you go outside, you look up in the sky, right? And you tell your mommy you love her, right? And she'll tell you back, right? You're going to do that. I couldn't hear her. Oh, but she can hear you. She's been through a lot. My new shoes. She's been through more tragedy in one day than some people go through their whole lifetime. Losing that many family members. She was 700 feet away from the trailer in some swampy woods. They heard her crying, hollering, help me, help me. Out of five, she was the only survivor. Until this day, she's scared to death in the dark. Mother Nature really beat her, beat her bad. Her eyes were swollen shut. She had cuts on her face, where it looked like she swiped a tree limb and a broken leg, ruptured spleen. She was just totally messed up. And I don't see how she survived it. She was sitting on the couch drawing pictures, and I seen little tears rolling down her eyes. I looked at her and I said, Ashley, what are you drawing? She said, Mommy. I said, Mommy? She goes, yeah, see, this is a tornado. And she showed me, she drew a little green tornado. Somebody was watching over her. Somebody made sure she was safe. He has something special for her in her life. It's definitely a miracle. I believe that the devil sent it, that God made it a miracle. There were angels there that night calling for help. I couldn't hear her. Oh, but she can hear you. We were probably that far away from each other, holding each other's hands. God, I can't make this decision. That's your decision, Lord. Life and death is your decision. Why did that little boy have to die? I had the highest privilege to say to her, I love you. They didn't bring out Dorothy and Mike or Betty and Donna. You cannot 
say, why me? Why my family? Because there's no answer. When he died, I just said goodbye to him and said, you go climb the trees and I'll meet you.